Well, thank you all for coming on this rainy Thursday night. Uh, welcome to Cultivating an Audience. It's our, can you hear me? You can hear me, yeah. Uh, it's our first event as a group for this year. We haven't actually done one uh, of, this, uh, of this size. Uh, and uh, before I continue though, probably some housekeeping. So if you haven't found the bathrooms, the bathrooms are actually down behind that uh, board and it doesn't have a big sign, but it's, it's a dual sex bathroom. So male and female enter in and there's a couple of doors there. So that's where the bathroom exits are over here. There's a fire exit there and there, and obviously you know where the lifts are. Um, and I will run through the agenda and sort of explain a little bit. But before I continue, I thought I'd thank the group that's uh, sponsored the food and the wine. Did you have something to eat and the, the beverages? We also do have um, Sangita from Fourth Wave Wine, who's giving some tastings of some European and Australian wine. So feel free in the break to actually go and taste some, something different. Uh, but Networking Connections is the group that sponsored the food and the beverages. Uh, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about Networking Connections. So we're a group of business owners that get together and you know, our whole reason for uh, getting together is to collaborate because sometimes being in business is a lonely place. Sometimes you don't have all the ideas. So when you collaborate, when you share with like-minded people, there's just a, a, a great thing that happens in terms of the knowledge and the education. And, and the reason Networking Connections has put this on is because we want to give back. We know that business is hard when you're a small business owner. It can be tough and especially in the retail industry, especially hospitality retail. So we're so thankful that we've got some really awesome speakers tonight to come along and uh, share their wisdom with us. Um, and it's also being uh, organised by Desketing. So you've probably seen the signs Desketing, Desketing, Desketing everywhere. Desketing were the ones, they had a special team that put together this event, organised, coordinated and invited a, a lot of you here and the speakers to come. So we just want to thank Desketing uh, and I'll just invite Dale to share a little bit about who Desketing is and what they do. Tonight we have put together three, three awesome speakers, and I can easily say they probably are the best we got in Brisbane. <laughs> Another thing I encourage everyone to do is to explore the power of networking. I'm sure before you come into the hall, you already need one or two. If you don't, don't worry. There's plenty of opportunity later on. I'm dying to find out what our audience have to offer today, uh, our speakers have to offer tonight. So, get back to you, Karen. Thanks, Dale. So, just to run through a quick agenda, if you want to flip through the next. Where's the clicker? Ah, uh, where did I give, oh. It's not much use on the uh, chair. So, the agenda for tonight is, I'm going to talk a little bit about why, and then we're going to introduce our speakers and each of the speakers are going to do a little talk about something that's of relevance to the industry, something that they've done and they're passionate about. And then after that we're going to have a 10 minute break where, or 10, 20 minute break where we're going to have a little bit more networking, a little break because it is quite warm in this room, a little bit more refreshments and more drinks. Then we'll come back and we'll actually have Dale share a few of the latest trends Plus, then we're going to have a panel discussion. So we aren't going to allow for questions during because we're going to save them all to the end. We do have a phone number which will flash up where you can actually text your messages 
to that um, uh, phone number and then we'll actually collate them and actually ask the questions at the end in the panel discussion. So that's going to be quite exciting. And then we'll wrap up with some uh, lucky door prizes. So if you haven't put your business card in, there's a big bowl here that we will circle around to put your business card in. There are some great prizes. I know Georgina's uh, given us a, a voucher for her restaurants and we've got a few other vouchers, some wine, a cookbook. Um, so yeah, I'll put that there. Okay, so. so why put on Cultivating an Audience? Dale alluded before that, you know, it's an event, I guess, to give back. It's an event to actually hear about the trends, how people have been successful. We've got some fabulous speakers up here that you've seen or may have met in, uh, earlier before that have done something right in their businesses. And you know, we live in a digital age that's changing so quickly. Remaining relevant is tough. It's, it's tough not in just the hospitality industry, it's tough in all industries. I'm an accountant and I see it in every industry that I deal with my clients everything's changing and it's changing at such a fast pace. It's hard to understand what's going to happen next and how do we keep alive and stay alive. So it's great that we have these uh, people that have come and given up their time to share. I know that Nick's come from uh, Sydney today to, sh to, to share his wisdom and uh, you know they've got busy lives, busy businesses, so they have really um, taken out some time to, uh, to, to give back to us. So. Uh, if you didn't know already, oh, flipped too quickly. These are our speakers who will be speaking today. So before I continue, I just want to sort of introduce our very first speaker. Ladies first, Georgina's going first. Um, I'll just read out a little bit about who Georgina is. Sorry, can I give you the flip? Okay, so we've got a, a lovely bio here. So. Georgina Venzen is a passionate businesswoman and a hospitality visionary. It's refreshing that from the young age of 24, Georgina Venzen became the general manager of the Venzen Group, a family business with interests in six Brisbane restaurants. And I've just found out there'll be a seventh. That's right, very soon. Georgina started her hospitality career young at the tender age of 13. That's not even allowed, is it? She was working part-time washing dishes in the first Venzen restaurant. Throughout school and university, she worked as a waitress and a maitre d' before graduating from the University of Queensland with a degree in business, hospitality and events. After travelling the world with her two best friends, Georgina returned to Australia and the family business. Following her own interests and expertise, as well as her personal dream, Georgina opened the informal Paw Paw Cafe. Now 28 years young, Georgina owns and runs the six restaurants and starting a seventh, having also um, built some other, two other successful cafes which they have since sold. And the seventh will be in the Brisbane Bayside, going back to her home of the Redlands where she grew up. Uh, like all the cafes, her new venture will offer a broad, eclectic menu appealing to a variety of discerning tastes. Georgina is also a passionate advocate of the Mind Shift Foundation and believes in the importance of having a positive sense of self and achieving solid outcomes in life. As the youth advocate for Mind Shift, Georgina believes overcoming negative influences and that the it's just the way I am attitude is the first step necessary to be successful in all aspects of life. Very pleased to welcome Georgina Venson, ladies first <laughs> and refreshingly young. Let's give her a warm welcome. Oh, this is my check out. So I. Oh, maybe I'll let you do it. You just look at it. Okay, I'll probably just talk. Um, is this enough? This is picky. Yeah? That's picky cool. the oh, okay. Can you guys can all hear me like this anyway? I'll get too nervous holding a microphone. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> how's everyone <laughs> going? <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. I'm Gina. Um, first of all, I'm a restaurant owner. I'm not a public speaker. So my heart is racing. I'm a little bit nervous. I talk very fast. I will do my best to slow down for you. Um, tonight I'm talking about social media because it has played a huge role in our business. Um, and I'm going to start with um, the things in, that you may forget about good social media. Um, slide. <laughs> um, so this is a little thing that I've learned um, recently. So obviously Instagram is huge and Instagram connects to your Facebook. Everything links up now. So we mostly use Instagram as our main um, social flow because it is the most powerful 
for our generation and it how things are moving it is just huge um, so a lot of one thing that people do forget um, is about using their Instagram link bio does everyone know what that Instagram link bio is if I say what that is no beautiful I'm gonna say whip out my phone or you can whip out your phone and look at your Instagram um, have some demonstrations so I'm gonna go on Popo and show you the Instagram link bio so in your Instagram account, you can put your own link in there. So this normally you do link to your website or something. So this is really key and powerful. Um, there's a now a new thing called a link tree um, and you can link multiple things. So now if we go to Purple, I'm getting called into work at the moment. They're saying, hey, we need help, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I told them I wouldn't be able to be here tonight. So I said, call someone in. <laughs> This is so powerful because now we can link. So pretty much when your Instagram now is like your website, you still have a link to your website, but people are going to Instagram first. When I'm looking up a cafe, I'm going onto Instagram. I'm not going Google, you know, where is this cafe? I'm going to Instagram. I'm looking up Brisbane cafes. And with now Linktree, which you don't have to use, you can just have one link. You can link to multiple elements of your business. So this is a great place to link to your website. Um, we're doing a Christmas in July um, promotion, which um, we want people to RSVP. Um, last week we just gave a, we did a giveaway where you won a thousand dollar trip, which we added in the link tree. Um, and we also have links to our app here. So try and get off Uber Eats, we have our own app, which you guys have as well, which is through Chewy. Um, and we want to get people ordering direct. So this is a great place to get people on all avenues that you need. Don't smile at me. <laughs> Um, and this is great because you can track where your customers are coming from. So that's a huge player in social media, which a lot of people forget about, but it's so important um, because it allows you to track it. Um, so I've got a little action for you. Make sure you go home and work on your Instagram handle um, and study that. Okay, next one we've got. Da -da -da. How, to how to maintain high level of engagement on your posts. So Instagram is a great way, again, to engage with your community. Um, people are coming in and posting. So this is obviously talking about the restaurant industry, but this can be with anything in general, whether a product that you're selling or you can take everything that I say today into your own business. Um, it's a great way to connect. Obviously, we know social media is a modern day word of mouth. Um, I can't even ask you questions today. You have to text the questions through. So there is a lot <laughs> less communication in general. I'm not going and telling my friends, hey, I had this great dinner. I'm going and uploading a photo and I'm sharing it with my five followers or my 10 followers or whatever it is. So Instagram is, and social and Facebook is modern day word of mouth. So it's important to keep engaged with your customers. Um, we, every couple of days, we, we log in and we reply. We thank everyone who's come into our restaurants and uploaded a photo. Thank you for coming in. We send them a DM message. We want to get them turning, coming back. So we send them a message saying, hey, come visit us again for buy one, get one free coffee. So it's a great way to get people coming back. It's a great way to thank people. Um, and also staying constant on with engaging is, is up, uploading regular posts um, two to three times a day because um, Instagram and Facebook is just like Google where it, um, it rewards consistency and, and uploading more. So that will get you higher ranked in people's feeds and they'll see you more. Um, something to encourage social media to get people coming in and posting is do a giveaway. So we, d we also do a giveaway every month. Upload your photo, hashtag where you are or your product or what it is and encourage that and you will go on the draw to win a $50 gift voucher or something like that. Okay, next, beautiful. Um, teaming up with influencers and creating exciting collaborations. Next slide. Um, this is another important thing. Are we all on Instagram or is this all going over your head? Just so I know. <laughs> um, Instagram is huge. People have five, five followers, people have 200,000 followers. Um, and it's, this is another great way for marketing and this is free because this is something that you can go home and do in your own time. You don't need to pay a marketing PR company to do this for you. This is something that you as a business owner can reach out yourself and spend your own time finding people. Um, so Brisbane Food Theory is a huge one that I refer to for, for restaurants. She's a Brisbane-based food blogger um, and, and, sh and she's great. So what you want to go do is then to find your customers. One, go see where, where she's posting, who has been posting under her photos. 
because they're all Brisbane-based customers. So they're going, hey, she's uploading a, a photo at Paw Paw. People are going, oh, I want to go there, I want to go there. These are your customers. So this is a way for you to find new customers and engage with them. So then you can also go and contact them and say, hey, I'm this restaurant. Whatever you want to do, find the right way to reach out. And that's a way of finding new customers as well as finding um, influencers. So people like Prison Food Theory, yet again, um, Influencers don't have to have a huge following because it can be big and small, they're influencing their friends to come in. Um, going under her, her photos and seeing who has been commenting and seeing their followers and the response they're getting and then inviting them in for an event at your restaurant. So action from this one is make a list of top influencers in your relevant feed or your, in your relevant industry. Um, this is back to getting us on, on the social feed. So once we've made our list of influencers, inviting them in for a dinner or whatever your business is, again, I've got to make this broader than restaurant. Um, if, let's say, when we have influence dinners, we try and have people with a bigger following, so 50,000 or more, because then they're talking to 50,000 followers. Um, and we'll give them a shebang. You have to think how much it costs you in food and wine. It doesn't cost when you're paying someone else in marketing. So, hey, come in, 10 to 20, influencers with a bigger following, give them a good time, they're going to upload, photo and share and then that's going to hit, hit 400,000 following. So that's a great way, modern word of mouth, getting it out there a lot quicker and staying constant. Um, am I talking too fast or am I okay? You're right, right? beautiful. Um, this is a little DIY of creating the right images for your feed. Um, yet again, when, on your bio, on your, on your feed, if you have a look, the first nine photos here are your main ones. So you want to keep these fresh and exciting. Um, how to get good content. One, trying to take photos during the day in natural light always is going to turn out better, especially for food and selfies and all that jazz. Um, downloading Visco or Lightroom. They're wonderful apps that have amazing filters, which will make everything look more sexy. Food is just like models. You want to make everything better. You, you order with your eyes. Um, people even come in and sometimes say it doesn't look like that, but food is the same thing like models. It's not real life. Um, but we eat with our eyes, so we want to get them in. Then everyone edits differently, and it's also a way of being creative and having your own creative flow. Oh, I'm at eight minutes. This is great. Um, and also a big thing is regramming customers' photos. Um, that brings back the community, and people love being involved, and people feel extra special when you're regramming their photos. And that's, that has been a major thing which has made Paw Paws following grow, so we've got 43,000 followers over five years, is because people come in and they want to get their photo regrammed. And you can see that on, if you look at Piggyback, my other restaurant. Regramming, okay, so I'm going to upload a photo onto my feed at Paw Paw, and then you're going to take that photo and upload it onto yours, and then you'll tag me. So I'm using, your, you want to use your customer's content. So there's, you tag them back. And then they go, yippee, thank you. And then you have a little conversation and then they feel special and you feel special and you're connecting with your customers. And it's great and it makes them feel a part of it. And people also, day and age, want their photos regrammed. And yeah. So main thing on that, because I'm running out of time. Um, I should go to the next one. Skip that one. I'm going to go to piggyback. Um, creating um, anchors in your business to encourage people to take photos. Um, Piggyback, does anyone know my cafe, Piggyback Cafe in Jindalee? Yay. <laughs> Have a look at it. We've gone viral on Instagram because a stupid little thing called Rainbow Coffee. Yeah. <laughs> um, what it is, it's just, yeah, right? We went like viral in America and it just made us crazy. And now our, our demographic there is so different from Paw Paw because we have people from all around the world coming just to get a photo with this goddamn rainbow coffee. <laughs> yeah, and it's crazy. And we were just fiddling around one day and I said, hey, we're putting that on the menu. And, and, and it's, if you want a coffee, if you're ordering in the register, I say, still order your latte because people come in for the rainbow coffee. Still order your latte, but order the rainbow coffee as well. So it's to create an anchor, create something to get people in, and then they're going to spend more money with you. And I'm out of time. I can't believe it. Thank you, Georgina. That was awesome. I love her energy. Um, I've got my own introduction because I didn't know you were going to introduce Oh, me. can I introduce you? Or would, can I introduce you? Or, but I loved... Um, 
yeah. I loved um, I loved the, your energy, Georgina, and I loved the little tips. I did not expect so many fa fabulous tips. Now I know how to make my food look sexy. It's Visco and Lightroom. That's why when I take photos of my food, it just doesn't look so great. Uh, and I don't post them because of that. So now I know that little tip. That's fabulous. And yes, if you haven't been to Piggyback Cafe, it is very famous for their rainbow coffee. The first thing I said to Georgina was, I haven't tried your rainbow coffee yet because it is so famous. Um, it, is, it is wonderful to see them prepare as well, to see the baristas prepare it. it is, it's lovely. It's really an art. So thank you, Georgina. And if you do have questions, this is the text, uh, the, the number to text your questions to. And, uh, and we will have them be asked at the end when we have our panel discussion. So, Nick. Yes. Matrosalis. We've got two Nicks. Have I said it right? Yeah. yeah? So, do you, want read do you want me to read yours? Uh, well, you can read it. and It's like you are me if you're reading it. <laughs> you can still do yours. I'll do mine. I'll, I'll read it. You can, you can do yours as well. We'll have two introductions of Nick no. Matrosoulis. Fast, fresh and authentically Greek. Nick Matrosoulis is bringing authentic Greek to the masses with the Euro shop. Nick is a young restaurateur with roots in Greece who has made himself a name with his business empire expanding across Fortitude Valley, Cannon Hill, South Brisbane, Kapalaba and Newmarket. Unsatisfied with the quality of Euros available in the market, Nick and his family took matters into their own hands, pouring over Yaya's recipe books and spending countless late nights perfecting the Euros. By doing so, the Euro shop has gained a loyal following and is quickly changing the perception of the late night kebab. Hordes of Euros lovers and rejoicing over finding, finally, authentic, traditional and fresh Euros. Nick continues to build on the success of the Euro shop and continues to live his passion and make it his mission to spread speedy, authentic Greek eats throughout Brisbane. And I found out today that there was a few gentlemen in my office that ordered, because they were craving for this wonderful Euros, they ordered Uber Eats and forgot to invite me. So I missed out on Euros. So if you've been to the Euro shop, <laughs> it's, right, it's fabulous. You <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Totally Thanks, right Nick. Guy. Do you want the mic? Uh, no, thank no? you. No? You're I sit all down good? This? You can sit I'm down. I'm also nervous as well. Um, no? <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want the... Okay, I'll sit. No. You can sit right, up. Um, no worries, okay. The click. Click for you, or would you like to? Oh, click? you can just um, click as you go. Yeah, yeah, I'll actually write everything out because I don't trust myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Nick Matrosoulis. I own the Euros shop. A little bit about myself. I'm 28 now, and when I opened the first store, I was 24. Same, same sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I had a dream and a vision, but looking back, I had no idea what I was doing. It was my first business I had owned. I worked in the food businesses from a young age. My grandparents owned a fish and chip shop in Broadbeach for many years and, and it was the talk of the town. I was only eight years old and used to run, up, run orders to customers and learn how to use a cash register. Then as soon as I turned 14, I got a job at Surface Paradise McDonald's <clears throat> and worked there for three years, working my way up to crew trainer. While I was young, I learned the customer is always right. Especially working in a family business, it has to be perfect because you take pride in your food. Basically, when I started the Euros shop, I knew I had a good product and there was a gap in the takeaway Greek food market in Brisbane. So I thought, let's give this a crack. I immediately started advertising on social media a good four to five months before we opened and did a flyer fly drop around James Street in Fortitude Valley. The, sh the Euros shop has only been <clears throat> running for three and a half years. Originally, my goal was to open three shops. But as time went on, I saw potential <clears throat> and I just want to keep pushing and see how far I can take it. <clears throat> I was lucky I had a group of friends in the hospitality industry that I asked for advice and everyone came together and helped me out. <clears throat> I, think my age, I think my age helped me because everyone was like, he's so young, trying to give it a go, let's help the little fella. It hasn't been an easy ride at all. There have been many times where I've had a bad day or week and thought, what am I doing here? But then I thought, look what I have. I believe in my product and my brand and just keep going along with the plan. <clears throat> it's only this year where I really started to understand my business and feel like I'm fully in control of it. 
One important bit of advice I got when I was starting out was run your business like a franchise. Even if you have one or two stores, he's, he was referring to your procedures and making everything consistent. To me, even when I only had a few shops, it was so important because you can't be there seven days a week watching everything. If procedures are in black and white and it, it saves confusion and people are more likely to follow them, you hope. It doesn't always work out like that. <laughs> uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about authenticity of food that you make and sell. The, and obviously uh, anything else that you do. <laughs> the first thing is identifying who you are, what your product is, and to do it to the best of your ability. No matter how much time goes past, you have to stick to your guns and make sure that product is a hero reason why people come back to you over going to your competition. Uh, I'll explain what a Euros is. It's traditional food you find in Greece and Cyprus, which is traditionally served with pita bread, tzatziki, onion, tomato, marinated pork, chicken or lamb, and chips all wrapped up. It sounds easy and very simple, but there are, there are key elements that all have to come together to make it a perfect Euros. For us to make it all come together, it took time, research, persistence, making sure everything is consistently as perfect as can be. There are a few key points I want to touch on that I think are important. When you're selling something and advertising it, whatever it may be, you have to be true to your word. Your customers are well-traveled and a sport for options these days. So one of the most important things if, is if you are selling something that says I'm selling euros or a burger or Thai food, that when they take that first bite, it's everything they expect it to be. Which Betty's Burgers and the Benson Group have done very well. <laughs> People eat food and auto automatically compare it to something they have eaten before, whether it be something they have eaten overseas or locally. They always like to, be, to judge. Oh, this is as good as the place I had when I was in Melbourne, or this is as good as the place when I had when I was in Greece. <clears throat> My aim was always to be, to have people come and eat my food and go, go somewhere else and say, nothing beats the Euros, Euros I have, had at the Euros shop. Research is very important. I traveled to Greece and Cyprus and ate all the Euros I could find. <laughs> uh, when I got back to Australia, I went to Melbourne, which has been, it's the biggest population of Greeks outside of Greece. I went around to all the Euros shops there and tried them, looked up re recipes online, then with trial and error, we made the sauce ourselves, tried marinating meat in different ways, uh, tried all sorts of chips, and always used the freshest veggies until we got the flavour profile right. Upon opening the first store, we had some challenges in Brisbane. The first one was not everyone knew what a Euros was. We had people coming into the store saying, it's a glorified, overpriced kebab. <laughs> <laughs> what people have said about us before they've tried our food has never bothered me because as soon as you have your first Euros, everything in your mind goes out the window and then you know what a Euros is. That's the reason why when you open a new store, we give out free Euros. It gives people that in that area who haven't tried a Euros before to give a chance to come in and have their first experience. And I'm 100% confident when they have their first one, they'll be back. Another challenge is everyone that has been to Greece knows exactly what a Euros is because most people live on them while they're traveling to the Greek islands. Usually you party all night, eat Euros all day. <laughs> so people eat them and compare them to the ones I've had in Greece. We are selling experience and that's why it's so important to make sure everything you do is traditional. When you, they take the first bite, it brings out memories and emotions and makes them feel good. Food is, food, food is a powerful thing not to be messed with. One of the biggest hurdles has been making sure the Greeks like our food and that's where making it traditional is most important also. If people see Greeks in your store or Greeks talking about your food, they don't automatically think this place must be good. For us, it is important because Greeks like to talk a lot and have something to say about absolutely everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, we passed the test and have many Greeks that are regular customers. A few, little, a few things that I think has uh, gotten my brand to where it is today. Being persistent, if you have a store or a product you know you love, uh, you know people love, but you're not selling enough, you sit there thinking to yourself, what's going on? Where are all the people? They say they love you, whatever it is you're selling. You have to be in their face because out of sight, out of mind in some cases. 
constantly pushing your social media, reminding them, hey, we're still here, open, selling the food that you love. Social media is everywhere and one of the easiest ways to get to your target audience. A cost-effective way, which Georgina has already said, is getting food, food bloggers into your business. Uh, I believe that like, the more the better, so I set up a week where we have all the bloggers come in and then you know, a lot of people are following different bloggers, so then you are ev everywhere. Like, you, you are popping up on all these different ones, so you're more likely to have people come into your store. Usually people are following a fair fee, yep. Free Euros days are a massive boost for our brand. Everyone loves something for free and it gets people talking and visiting your page. So you can, you can advertise to them in the future. We have mini competitions, tag free friends and get a hundred dollar voucher. <laughs> um, but you, uh, the hundred dollars will reach a lot of people, but you can't always be giving away things. It weakens your brand and obviously you'll go broke if everything's free all the time. I've just finished the Euro Shop ad that we are going to put in cinemas and on YouTube. Um, and that's about it. Ah. Great. Thanks, Nick. That's awesome. I, uh, I love the authenticity in terms of your recipe that you really went to everywhere and bought Euros to perfect the best Euros. So I'm yet to try it so i can't wait now i really want to eat a euros <laughs> i've been hearing about it all day now our next speaker nick oh don't forget to text your questions if you have them for nick metropolis uh, on this number so 0433 039 053 um so nick rollinson i've got a big bio for you Oh boy. <laughs> Nick Rollinson brings to the table 24 years of experience spanning a diverse array of first rate food and beverage programs in many international locations. Nick finds himself in Sydney after receiving the opportunity to lead the food and beverage division as general manager through a $950 million redevelopment of the Star Hotel and Casino located on Sydney's iconic Darling Harbour. Under his leadership, he successful, successfully opened eight restaurants, including Momofuku Sabo in partnership with David Chang. The highly anticipated, this highly anticipated restaurant quickly achieved numerous accolades, including three chef's hats, best new restaurant and hottest new restaurant from publications such as Gourmet Traveller and Sydney Morning Herald. Along with the other signature restaurants like Black by Ezard and Astoria Valla Banfredi, Nick successfully opened three high volume bars in McKee and Marquee, Sydney, voted two years in a row as Australia's best nightclub in partnership with the infamous Tower Group of New York and Las Vegas. Wow. <laughs> I'm exhausted even saying it. Uh, with his youth spent in the southwestern United States, Nick found his passion and career grow in Las Vegas. With, while there, Nick spent nearly four years working for MGM Resorts International with the most significant opportunity of joining the pre-opening team for the 4,004 room mega resort, Ari Resort and Casino. As the Director of Restaurant Operations, Nick has had the privil privilege of collaborating and operating restaurants with the likes of Michelin star chefs as Masayoshi Takayama, Michael Mina, Jean Georges von Reichen, von Reichen and Sirio Maccioni. With a team of over 3,200 employees falling under his, uh, under his guidance, no project is too large or complex for his experience. Throughout his career, Nick has spent time in nearly every role in the food and beverage industry, which gives him an intimate knowledge of how every position fits with the food and beverage puzzle. This highly energetic and motivated individual has also a strong passion for wine and service, who is also certified by the Court of Master Sommeliers. Wow. And he's also the founder of Betty Burgers, which we didn't even have on here. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my goodness, oh yeah, what a bio. Too. So yeah. Nick has come with a wealth of experience and he's going to share something quite interesting and what I absolutely love um, about how he has uh, succeeded by the strength of his team. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, I didn't realize Nick. the whole thing was going to be read verbatim. <laughs> Do you want this? No, thank you. I no. I thought you were going to strip that down a little bit, but uh, <laughs> had I known that. Um, I'm Nick. That was a bit embarrassing, but uh, I'm, I'm not nervous standing up here. I'm okay with this. Uh, so a little bit of background on me. Uh, I've been in the restaurant business. Sorry, I didn't um, 
typing thing out, so I kind of have to stand sort of off to the side to, to read what I wrote just to remember. Been in the restaurant business since I was 16 years old. My first restaurant job was waiting tables. Uh, my career has given me the experience to work in the United States, Caribbean, and Australia. I've been in Australia about eight years now. Love it here. Uh, I've worked for both privately held and publicly traded uh, restaurant and uh, hospitality environments, if you will. So I understand, you know, having to deal with shareholders and private owners, two different sets of agendas and levels of importance, two different budgets, of course, as well. Uh, I started a consulting firm with an architect partner friend of mine, and um, our firm, what we, our, our general business premise was to create, design, and on-sell restaurant and bar concepts. So he would do all the architecture, interiors, and designs, and I would come up with what it is, how it looks like, how it trades, uniforms, menus, staffing levels, budgets, small wares, basically restaurant in a box, and we would on-sell the restaurant without even having to build it, which was quite nice. It was a desk job, which was wonderful. Um, our first customer, uh, his name was David Hales, for which we developed a fast, casual burger concept that was planned for the Sunshine Coast. Uh, David came to us and said, look, I've got a spot in Noosa on Hastings Street. I think we can do burgers or fish and chips or maybe like pizza or something. What do you, what do you reckon? Can you come give us some ideas on how to build a site? David was retired at that stage. He retired in his uh, early 30s. He sold a massive pub group in Tasmania and he wanted a little hobby to keep himself busy. So he was cool with whatever. So uh, we spent some time developing, a number of months developing uh, the concept, uh, which when we finalize it, it is now known as Betty's Burgers and Concrete Company. During the conceptualization phase, I brought in a, a longtime colleague of mine. His name is Michael Tripp to develop the menu. Michael and I worked together in Las Vegas. He's from Las Vegas and he and I worked together uh, in the casino uh, in Sydney. He came out to Australia to do a couple restaurants um, with me and then he went back to Las Vegas and I rang him up and said, hey dude, we're going to do this burger thing. You want to come out and whip up a couple burgers real quick and we're going to sell it for a bunch of money and then we'll just you go back to Las Vegas. And then um, long story short, <laughs> long story short, he hasn't gone back to Las Vegas. So his, <laughs> he, he moved back to Australia full time again for the second time, brought his whole family. Um, so after the concept was completed, uh, we all formed a partnership and have since opened 10 Betty's across Queensland, Vic, and New South Wales. So we basically created the concept, on sold it, and then sort of kind of bought back into the concept um, after we gave it away. What's next for Betty's? We have seven new restaurants at various stages of design that should all be open by December 2018. We have another seven restaurants, not restaurant seven, planned for no later than October 2019. Um, it's, it seems like it might be a bit aggressive, but we did our first restaurant in December 2014, and then our second restaurant wasn't again until November 2015, so we took almost a year to sort of settle and get figured out. And then after the second restaurant, we sat in literally a warehouse shed for six months and documented everything. We wrote down every single thing we do. We did it in black and white, how to open, how to close, how to order, how to discipline, how to turn the lights on, how to turn the lights off, how to deal with guests, how to go to the bank. We wrote it all down. We went from one thing to a stack like this. We said, all right, let's go trial it. So we put it in the shop and we went to go see if it worked and it took ages and a lot of the stuff didn't work and some of the stuff is exactly how we wrote it up now two and a half, three years ago. That was advice given to us by the founder owner of Grilled, Simon Crow. I did a little bit of work for him and I went and asked him, I said, if you would do anything differently, if you could do something differently today that you, you know, based on what you know now versus what you knew then, he said, I would have stopped and put everything in writing because I got the 20 stores and it was so loose and I couldn't keep control of anything. And so we just stopped and said, all right, let's go sit in the shed for six months and try to get this figured out. Um, what, what, is, what the hell does that say? How have you attracted such an amazing following? Um, well, we let our team do the talking. So kind of like Gina, um, our Instagram, we use Instagram as our one and only piece of advertising and marketing. Um, we're not particularly intelligent. We don't know much about the advertising space or marketing. We don't know anything about print media, digital media. We don't know anything about that. Um, but we know that we wanted to build a brand that people wanted to associate themselves with, and obviously social media is the way to do it. So uh, by no means did we think we were creating a unique, um, we're, we were unique by creating a burger concept. There's kajillions of them out there. There's nothing unique about burger restaurants, zero. Uh, we spent countless hours discussing and refining what we believe was our point of difference. In the end, along with an amazing product, we wanted to create a memorable experience for our guests with multiple interactions in what, what could easily be perceived as a quick service restaurant. So there's two key words in there that are very important to us, right? Um, we, tr I have a 
potty mouth in general, but in, in our stores we do not use the C word. You cannot use the C word in our stores, and that word is customer, right? We call them guests. There's a di big difference in the way you treat a customer versus the way you treat a guest in our view, right? A customer is associated with an interaction, okay? Or sorry, a transaction, excuse me, I, I even get myself tripped up. A customer is associated with a transaction. Customers go to Bunnings. Cost customers go to Shell. Customers go to BP. Guests are associated with interactions. Hotels, guests in your home, coming into a restaurant, in a bar. So we like to establish the, um, the concept of interactions within our venues, and that's what we want to do. Um, and we let our teams do that. So um, it's also unique for a quick service restaurant, right? You, quick service restaurants are very transactional. Uh, McDonald's, Hungry Jack, so forth, very transactional, right? We want to create an interaction. Uh, we created a comprehensive organizational structure with team members that have a strong understanding of what service really means. So we went out and we tried to hire people that are like from the restaurant business, like worked at One Hat Restaurants, no rock pool dining, they work down at Pony, they've been to places, they know what it means to create an interaction. And then you can't sucker some person to come work at a fast food restaurant on fast food money who's actually worked at a real restaurant. So we had to pay big dollars and create structure around them because no general manager in their right mind wants to go work a cheeseburger shop and have to sweep the floor and do the rosters and do whatever because all the general managers at these wonderful restaurants, they waltz in, they collect the tip pool, they have a few drinks at night, they're just the host with the most, right? <laughs> That's what's great about being a restaurant manager. However, you can't sucker those people into coming and working in a quick service environment unless you surround them with the support. So we did that, but we expect a little bit more out of the trade and the budget and what the guests receive, right? We're going to pay these people what they deserve. We're also going to try to give our guests what they deserve. Our staffing levels compared to comparable establishments are unheard of. We did this to ensure each guest has an interaction with our team, and when an opportunity arises to capture a guest's positive view on our restaurant, we take it. So we've got 10 restaurants now. Um, both of our Brisbane restaurants, I think, are top 10 in all restaurants in TripAdvisor in Brisbane, full stop, not burgers, just restaurants. Our Ravina restaurant's number one. Out of all restaurants in Melbourne, all, fast, fine, casual, whatever, our Melbourne restaurant's number 17 on TripAdvisor. Because when people bite in that cheeseburger and say, damn, this is good, you do social media, we'd love to hear your feedback on Google or TripAdvisor. Give us a shout and walk away. Nine out of 10 probably don't do anything about it. One out of 10 say, yeah, shit, yeah, I do social. I'll give these fools some love. So we actually, capture the experience. We put people everywhere in order to do that, right? Because that creates, that perpetuates business. It's very important to us. I'm going to go faster. Instead of spending the traditional three to five percent on advertising and marketing materials, we decided to increase our labor budgets by the same amount to ensure we have more staff than typically required to create a service experience, right? So instead of two or three or four or five percent to go on the radio or taxi backs or buses or whatever, nope, put staff on the floor and let's make sure that we just talk to every single person, create experiences. Our guests do the advertising for us. In turn, we created a platform for guests to do the advertising for us in a couple of ways. We built a social media presence that is more about lifestyle and less about the product. So my partner, Michael, he's a chef by trade, super qualified, worked for Michelin star chefs. We don't care about his food. We tell him to his face, your food is not important. What's important is that people want to have to associate with it, right? The burger's delicious. We love it. The concrete's amazing. We think ours is the best in the market, but we don't talk about that. We don't shout about that, we don't put it on, oh, we're the number one, it's good. No, it's not important. It's important about people wanting to associate with what the product is. So when you look at our Instagram page, we layer in just as many, if not more, lifestyle shots. Every other shot, some person with a surfboard or some bird landing on, you know, on the ocean or some palm tree with the sunset because it's about wanting to, you want to look at it and go, damn, I want to go to there right? Versus a, how many times can you look at a cheeseburger and care about it? You don't. No one, care, no one cares. No one cares about a bucket of chips. They don't care. It's not important. I don't care about it. I don't look and go, I can't, no offense, but I'm, so, I'm trolling Instagram to find me a euro. Can't wait. No, Woo, look at that Thai curry. God, I'm so, so excited. No, I want to have an experience, right? So for us, it was like, let's not talk about the burgers. Let's talk about the lifestyle. And when we have guests in the store, we always check on them to ensure the experience is what they expected. When the feedback is positive, we encourage them to use whatever form they prefer to tell people about Betty's. How do you gain a solid reputation for amazing burgers? Almost done. I know my time's up. Consistency is key. Throughout the de development phase of our concept, we tried to view everything we did with a hundred store mentality. 
product, service, and design all needed to be clearly documented, easy to follow, and replicable. The easiest part to replicate was the recipes. It's pretty straightforward. We did use some products that were hard to find, and we constantly had supply chain issues. So we went out of our way to get stuff that wasn't available because it's too hard bucket for other people. That was the point of difference. Like, all right, we're going to go totally out of our way because every other sucker in the market is not going to do this, so we'll be the suckers that actually do do that, and maybe it'll pay dividends for us. So in the first two years, we were doing things that were way harder than they needed to be, but we never compromised on the quality uh, of ingredients. One example is that, example of that, and I'll get to it on this slide right here. We went out of our way to ensure that our burgers were unique in every way to give us a point of difference. The bun is our own recipe. The meat is our own proprietary blend. The sauce takes 48 hours to make properly. The custard is our own recipe. Even the mayonnaise, no one was using it that we were aware of. We bought a truck just so we could go to a warehouse store and buy mayonnaise that was not in any distributorship in Australia, right? Just to get them, and like, mayonnaise, mayonnaise, mayonnaise. No, it's not. When you add it all up, right, we went totally out of our way to do something that other people won't do. Was it cost effective? Were we probably making money in the first couple of, no, not really. But eventually you start to really pick up steam and people don't try that hard. Um, we make every order fresh to order and never par cook anything. Our kitchens are all open design so you can see everything that's going on. Our guests really enjoy that. Uh, they can see the freshness of the product and can watch every stage of production. I think that's it. Oh, sorry. Last one. Like Gina, the food needs to look just like the picture. Whilst we don't have any images on, of our burgers published in store or online, our guests and followers really like to take shots of their burgers and share it with their friends. Our food is very photogenic, so we try to ensure that all restaurants put out the exact same quality each and every time. People love to share their lunch. With all their friends, look at my lunch, everybody. I'm not interested, but we want to make sure when they're sharing their lunch with their friends, it's just like they saw on Insta page. In fact, you talked about the sharing tree or whatever on Instagram. We linked our Instagram feed to our website. So when you go to our website, you feel like you're on Instagram or vice versa. And as people load content or we load content, it goes right on the website. You just get the same experience. It's important to us. Thank you very much. That was it. Awesome. Oh, wow, awesome. that was wonderful. Thanks, Nick. I love that you uh, have that silent word that no one's allowed, the C word. <laughs> Guests. And, you know, I guess That's the it. big take back is that guest experience. And I think in any business, whether you're in hospitality or anything, it's that guest experience. It's giving your clients, customers, guests that wonderful experience. And I think there's a really common theme between the, all three speakers is that, you know, Finding your point of difference and making that, you know, a wonderful experience for your, for your guests. You know, each of them have a real authentic, that's how I felt, story and, and authentic uh, item in their business or authentic way of doing business that, uh, that you know, I think really resonates with their, with their guests, which is why they've been able to be successful. <laughs>